like ET says, red dude. Five, four, three, two, one. Good morning. Good morning. Smash the like button. Smash that like button, guy. We appreciate it. You know what I'm gonna tell you? Huh? At the end of, uh, at the end of you downloading, and at the end, I'm gonna tell you. Don't forget to post the video. Oh, yeah. That happens. So, um... I had to call him in the morning, guys, and tell him, you forgot to post the video, babe. But he, we fell asleep really late, guys. So, you know, when you go into a church, they pass the basket, you know, to give a tithe or an offering or a special offering or a love offering, whatever you want to call it. Well, in our virtual church here at Relevant Bible Talk, we're passing the baton, the baton, we're passing the basket around, and you throw a, a like in there. That's what you do, that's all. That's good. You throw a like. So throw a like into the, whatever you want to call it, love offering, tithe. Smash the like button. Yeah. Throw your like in there. And um, as we're virtually passing... The basket. <laughs> the little blue like button. The one that he said wasn't blue, remember? When he says that he was wrong for the third time ever in his life. So relevant Ooh. Bible talk, we pass we passing the, the offering plate and throw a like in it. So um today was a, another busy day. It's the 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 hours now are counting down for my uncle's celebration of life. Getting a lot done. You know what we did get Still a chance to, to go. do though? What? We literally got a chance to take an hour and a half off today though, guys. And watch a movie. I don't remember the last time we did that. We, I don't know what happened. We literally we just I sat in I sat on the bed for a quick moment. Well, Cause we were running around, we came and it was and I'm like, man, I gotta get back to work. And I sat down and I was charging my phone. And I, I lay down. I had to lay down for a little bit. Um, and then he's like, I'm going to sit for a minute. And he's like, do you mind if I just turn on the TV for a moment? And I'm like, no, it's okay. I go, I'm not bothered. You know, go ahead and turn it on. And he's like, oh, my God, look. He goes, that movie from the 80s is on here. Beat, Beat Street? Yeah, 1984 Beat Street. Yeah, Beat Street's on here. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that. And so he pressed play. And we just got into it. So we were watching Beat Street from 1984. And I'm like, it was just a throwback from the past. It was crazy. I was yeah. like, you remember the days where things, you know, when we thought that was like, you know, back then it's like, I don't know. It's just so weird because back then people thought that that was kind of crazy. And now we look at that and we're all like, we wish things were like that. If only now. they used the I remember back then, um, my Christian family saying, oh, they're dancing, that's of the devil, this and that, whatever. And once gangbanging came in after that, I think a lot of parents wished their kids were back to break dancing and, and, and pop locking. And dancing or doing that. And yeah. Like a battle. I remember battling people and it was a dance off, basically. I mean, how innocent the times were back in the early 80s, you know? And we had no idea this dark cloud of, of gangs and drug infestation and, violence, and yeah. violence was it was like this dark cloud that was looming coming in and we had no idea what was gonna happen. And I was telling uh, Sharon how innocent it was, you know, back then. It was a different time. Yeah. It was like the quiet before the storm before all of hell broke loose. You know, so um We got a chance to just, you know, really take an hour and a half off to just and then it went right back it. to work. <laughs> yeah. So here we are, and just... we're still, still. I got some stuff I got to do now, and I have, I have a um, the computer, the it's not a laptop, uh, but what's it called? The home computer. What are they uh, called? The PC. I don't know. Yeah, whatever. The desktop. Home, the desktop. That's the one I do video editing on. That's where I have the software for video editing, where I've made the movie Always With You and the music videos. So I got to make a video collage on that. And then we have the church laptop, and that's the one that has a PowerPoint and um, uh, Photoshop and all that. That's what I was working on, doing a lot of the photos. 
you know and um and then we have the other laptop that's the one we do the obs or the things that we do the live stream on you know so each one has its own purpose that we use it for so i'm like bouncing around different computers just you know so right now i'm going to jump off the photoshop one to jump on the video editing one yeah so it's probably going to be somewhat of a long night, hopefully not too late. And then tomorrow, which is Friday today, because it's Thursday right now for us, is uh, that's where we finish everything and um, and just get everything ready. Oh, I can have the other one printing, though. Yeah, the laptop came in handy. You know, you know about right before the pandemic happened. Right before. Literally right before the pandemic happened, guys, um, we had a brother from, San, was it San Jose Bay? Did Santa Rosa. From? Santa Rosa. He, he messaged us and he said, listen, um, we have several um, desktops that I'd like to donate. To he had a pallet. Yeah, that I'd like to donate to um, some families from the church if you have a few families. And I have, you know, I think it was, was it two or three, three laptops that I'd like to donate for to the, the church. church. And, you know, it's crazy because our laptop, our only church laptop that we had kept messing up and... It kept freezing, and some of you that have been with us for a little bit over a year, you know that our, our, our laptop... Christmas service was crazy. <laughs> the whole PowerPoint yes, just the... froze. We, we were kept freezing, so it was like right on time, like the Lord knew. And, you know, they're, they're older laptops, you know, but man... He they, had them all refurbished. Yeah, they, they work wonderful, and we're all like, I don't care if they're they're fat and they're still old style, we'll, we'll work with it. So we were happy to have them. We're all like, yeah. absolutely, we'll take them. <laughs> it's okay if they're bulky and everything. So we, we, we took them, and we've been using them for the church, and they're, they're amazing. We were able to bless, like... A total of like 13 families i think yeah like 12 13 families we chose like families that we know that didn't have desktops or anything and you know what you know what the crazy thing is is that these were families that did not have computers and then the pandemic hit is that is that strategic the way yeah, the lord works that's crazy because these were families that had a lot of kids that you know were bigger families and that we knew they didn't have, you know, anything like this. And then the pandemic hits. And they were going to need these during this time. Mm -hmm. The like, Lord knew? The Lord knew that they were going to be needing yeah. these computers. I didn't even think about that till right now. I'm like, whoa. Yeah. My desktop is crazy because I've had that since 2000, since I started the church in 2011. I needed a computer. And actually, Sister Dana's dad, um, Sister Dana... Some of you that are old school know who she is, um, or she's on Facebook too. Her dad gave me a check, and he says, I want you to buy the best computer you can with this. And at the time, I mean, I'm a very techie person. I got, like, the computer that was, like, of the future at that time, <laughs> which is perfect because now it still works nine years later. Yeah. And I do complete, I, I edited an entire movie always with you on that. And all the music videos I've done, I still have that computer, you know. At that time, that's when uh, the quad cores came out. And it was a really fast quad core, which now it, it it's getting old now, but it still does what it needs to yeah. do. Yeah. I, I yeah. use it for the prison ministry yeah. for everything. So I like yeah. it. So anyways, that's enough, enough computer talk. I know, but, but you know what? It's it's a blessing. So, you know, we're, like the Lord worked strategically for what we needed it now. So yeah. that's a blessing. Yeah. I, well, remember, guys, I remember he was like, do not use this for the church rent. Do not use this for the church electricity. I want you to use every penny toward a computer. Aww. You know, so I went to Best Buy and got that. Amen. If you guys have been to my house... It's a it's a thirty two inch monitor. <laughs> for me, that my eyes are bad, guys. That's what I use yeah. for the prison ministry. So I get to sit there and I'm just like, oh, this works beautiful for it's me. Huge. Yeah, because yeah. I can't yeah. see good. <laughs> yeah. All right. So today we're gonna go to Galatians. Yeah, we're going to the. And he's um, gonna set the stage. Look at Galatians. I wanted to talk about the Apostle Paul. Paul was somebody that hated Christians. He actually had warrants for Christians. He actually 
gave a nod to kill Stephen or yeah. Stephen. They stoned him to death. And at, sat there and watched. At the nod of Paul, you know. So um, he completely wanted to destroy Christianity and Christians and anybody that believed in Jesus. He was a Pharisee. He was a he he was under the wing of a very high ranking Pharisee named Gamaliel, who was a basically a professor and people. He was well respected, and Paul was under him. And as you know. Paul wrote a lot of the New Testament, so obviously you know he became a believer. And here's the thing. He had a very bad reputation. And he surrenders his life to Christ. And you would think that once he surrenders life to Christ, he's like on fire for God. And he wants to go and start evangelizing and this and that. But he does the opposite. And that's what I want to read about here. In Galatians, he talks a little bit about what happened after his salvation. Hmm. You know, so, um, matter of fact, um, you know what, I think in, let's start from 10. I think it sets the stage better. Okay, sounds good. Really quick, guys. Look, look up there. What? I put the cross up. I put the cross that um, Anthony gave me up there. Oh. Up there? Oh, wait. Yeah, show. Right the there. One? Yeah, the wooden one. Then there's a turquoise one up there. You see it? Go. Right there. Where's that one from? Um, was that the one we got at the... At that Bible place. The one that was closing? Yeah. 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 I put his head, put his up. I was very happy to put it up. So this sets the stage, guys. Um, we're going to start at... It starts at 10? Okay. Yeah. We'll start it at 10. starts at 10. So Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. And we're going to start and stop here. And Are there. you reading the New King James? Yeah. Okay. Look, you can't see it because it's camouflage. And I have a green shirt. So if I go like this, you can't see me at all. It's, I'm like the predator. So, all right. What? I'm right here. You didn't. I didn't disappear. I just put the Bible over my face. I know the camouflage is... Predator style. Are you ready? All right. Verse 10. He says, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. But it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Go from 10 to 12 first. Do you think I speak this strongly in order to manipulate crowds? Or curry favor with God? Or get popular applause? If my goal was popularity, I wouldn't bother being Christ's slave. Know this. I am most sympathetic. Emphatic. Em emphatic. Here, friends. This great message I delivered to you is not mere human optimism. I didn't receive it through the traditions, and I wasn't taught it in some school. I got it straight from God, received the message directly from Jesus Christ. This is a bold statement, first of all. This yeah. isn't even the part we're getting to, but this is a bold statement. you got to understand that this highly likely the book of Galatians was written before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So it's not like Paul had the Gospels to preach from. So Paul's making a bold statement. He goes, everything I preach, he goes, I didn't receive it from other men. When he says I am most emphatic here, what is that What is that meaning? Well, let me get to, the, okay. I didn't even finish my point I was making. What was the point I was making? Oh, yeah. Where he's, he, he's not saying, listen, I didn't learn this from, you know, because he didn't have the Gospels. So he's basically making a bold statement saying, hey, the gospel I preach, I didn't receive it from anybody. I received it from Jesus himself. Yeah. So now let's back up on the part you're saying. He goes, I am most emphatic here, friends. So on here, what verse is that? You don't know, huh? Because mm -mm. it mixes it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what it. I am most emphatic here. I just got to come here. It's not going to tell you where it's at. Yeah, I don't know. Let's 
Let's go back. Go back to the thing. No, to the translation you were in. Okay. Go. So, you know, um, I, I like the way it also put it here. It's interesting how it says that, uh, you think I speak this strongly in order to manipulate crowds. And that is such something that, that actually is very important because I think that when, when, when television came in, cameras came into the picture, you know, and um, it might seem off topic, but have you ever seen how the singers looked, famous singers, worldly singers, have you ever seen how they looked before the MTV age? They look like dorks because on, cause musicians are pretty much nerds. They're musical nerds, you know, and, and all of a sudden, and it's funny because um, uh, um, all of a sudden MTV came in and it became about looks. Yeah, they had a, a persona too. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It, wasn't, it was no longer about the musician and the music and, and, and how good somebody could play or how somebody good could look. Or look the part, or you know. So, um, what's, what's that song? There's an old song. Anyways, I don't want to go there. But basically, in this day and age, same thing with Christianity. People can want to be stars, you know. And I like what he says there. He goes, "Do you think I? I where's it at? Do you think I speak this strongly in order to manipulate crowds? You know." And I think that's a strong statement unto itself. Or curry favor with God or get popular applause. And I love the fact that Paul is saying, listen, everything I'm about to tell you, I'm not telling you this so you can applaud me. I'm not telling you this so you can give me kudos. I'm not telling you this so I can be the man. You know, he goes, this great message I delivered. He goes, I didn't receive it from man or traditions or anything. I received it from Jesus himself. Yeah. And I think that we should be able to, we should pray that we have that same attitude. Yeah. You know, of, of uh, I don't. I'm not gonna be a people pleaser. Yeah. You know. He's not looking for human optimism. Yeah. You know. I love that he goes. If my goal was popularity, I wouldn't bother being Christ's slave. Mm. I remember guys reading that, and you gotta remember, I came from the music industry, and um, once in a while, I'll still get an email saying, like people say. Uh, um, Oh, you took the money from from being a, a recording artist, but you found out a better way to get money. Mm. And I'm like, really? Because where's that money at? <laughs> you know, it, it, it's weird because people run with the notion and they think, because there is a stereotype of pastors having money. And, and unfortunately, some people, especially televangelists, live that life, you know, yeah. to confirm it. So you automatically assume, you know, just it's the same thing with police. Oh, one's bad, so they are bad. Yeah. Or a doctor, one's doctor, so they're all... You know, it doesn't work that way. Well, we saw that. We saw a whole country that was in array because of one police yeah. officer. Yeah, and here's the thing, right? Whatever it is you do in the living, whatever you do in your job, I guarantee somebody is horrible at that job, so does that make you horrible? Yeah. Think about it. You know, what if you're a counselor? Are you a teacher? Are you a professor? Are you... um? An elevator guy. Mm. So I guarantee you, somebody... Are you a waitress? Are you a cook? Does that mean one cook is bad, so you're bad? No, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. You know, so anyways, uh, we're not even to the point yet. Um, where are we at, 13? Yep. So then he talks about his testimony. He goes, you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism. Remember, he was a hardcore Jew. You've heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism. Remember I told you he, he started climbing the ladder. I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Oh, I, actually, I meant to stop at 15 okay. or 16. 
I'm yeah. sure that you've heard the story of my earlier life when I lived in the Jewish way. In those days, I went all out in persecuting God's church. I was systematically destroying it. I was so enthusiastic about the traditions of my ancestors that I advanced head and shoulders above my peers in my career. Even then, God had designs on me. Why, when I was still in my mother's womb, he chose and called me out of sheer generosity. Now he has intervened and revealed his son to me so that I may joyfully tell non-Jews about him. That's 15? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, 16, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Keep going. Mm -hmm. He says, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, remained with him 15 days, but I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed before God I do not lie. And afterward I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. And I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but they were hearing only. He who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God in me. Immediately after my calling, without consulting anyone around me and without going up to Jerusalem to confer with those who were apostles long before I was, I got away to Arabia. Later I returned to Damascus, but it was three years before I went up to Jerusalem to compare stories with Peter. I was there only 15 days, but what days they were, except for our master's brother James. I saw no other apostles. I'm telling you the absolute truth in this. Then I began my ministry in the regions of Syria and Cilicia. After all the time and activity, I was still unknown by the face among the Christian churches in Judea. There was only this report. That man who once persecuted us is now preaching the very message he used to try to destroy. Their response was to recognize and worship God because of me. So this is the point we wanted to get to. The other stuff was like footnotes. But basically, Paul, he surrenders his life to the Lord. He was really high-ranking in Judaism. He was really high-ranking of reputation. He was very educated. So you would think the moment he accepts Christ, he would just take off running. Yeah. But the scripture says, by his own testimony, he says, I went away for three years. He went away for three years. Remember how the previous verse, he says, everything I learned, I learned from Jesus himself. This is what he did. He separated himself, went to Arabia and Damascus for three years. So it was just a relationship between him and God. Why do I bring this up, guys? It's because of this. Unfortunately, in our era right now, in the day and age of fast food and microwaves, we end up making our walk that way too. And we surrender to Christ and we take off running and it destroys a lot of people. Not only yourself, but unfortunately sometimes it destroys the people around you. You know, and and we should take note of what Paul is saying. And and here's the thing though, here's here's the hardest part is you see somebody come in the church and you see them on fire for God. If you sit them down for three years, you know what they'll do? They'll just leave and go somewhere where somebody won't make them sit down. When really it's the person that gets hurt in the end. You know, like, and people want everything now. We want Amazon Prime now. You know, we want microwave popcorn now. We want want to get married now. now. Yes. (laughs) And nobody wants to wait, you know? And it's like, I thank God. I'm the, I was the same way. When I first surrendered my life to the Lord, man, you know, I was on fire. I was a firecracker ready to go, and I didn't know anything, man. I thank God now that the Lord held me in prison for six years. Six years, and ministry was still hard. It was still hard. Yeah. When I got out and a year later started House of Rest, 
If I could go back to talk to David that year, I'd be like, dude, don't do it. You're insane. Don't do it yet. You know? And I would have waited for you to come along <laughs> to do it, you know? And even then we would have had trouble. But it's like, man, you know, like, guys. You would have waited for me, babe? Yes. Hmm. You know, it's, 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 Paul, there was wisdom in him going away for three years. But people don't want to hear that. And, and it's a hard sw pill to swallow. But it's the truth. You know, um, in my aquarium, my plants kept floating up. Yeah. Remember? Mm -hmm. I'd wake up in the morning, all my plants would be floating. I would stick the stem real deep into the, into the gravel. Next day, they'd all be floating. And finally, I went to YouTube. People put weights on them. People do this. People do that. People say, put a rubber band around it, you know, and into a rock. But eventually, the rubber band deteriorates. And then they float up again. Now you got rotten rubber band all over the place. So this is, this is a weird thing, right? This is what it came down to. This is completely safe. They said, you got to crazy glue the bottom stems to a rock. So I did it. Okay. But because I had so many life plants, this is life plants I'm talking about. Because I had so many life plants, I didn't wait long enough for some of them to dry. Because there's a curing, there's a curing uh, uh, time, I guess, for the glue to set. Mm -hmm. This is crazy glue. Once you crazy glue something, it is not coming off. But if you don't allow it to cure. So some of the rocks that were glued to the clumps of plants... They went into the aquarium beautifully. But within two days, they started to come loose. And it didn't make sense to me. You know what happened? It's because the glue wasn't cured, so the elements of the water basically diluted it. And mm. it didn't hold. Mm. It was meant to be strong, strong. Crazy glue. It all came out from the same tube. And the ones that I allowed to cure are still stuck to the rocks to this day, and now the plants are flourishing. But the other ones got diluted and eventually didn't hold. That makes sense. This is the same with some Christians. And I, I am guilty, we are guilty, because sometimes we don't want to push people away. At the same time, you don't want to hold people back. And what ends up happening is you put them in a position... Too quick. And the glue gets diluted and it doesn't hold and it falls apart. Yeah. You know, so this is a lesson to everybody, guys, that sometimes you got to let yourself be cured. And it's interesting that word cured. Yeah. Because, because there's a curing process. Yes. And sometimes we need to be cured in here. Yes. You know, and Paul knew that about himself. He's like, dude, I'm a brainiac. I can go in and I can speak eloquently and this and that. But he understood something. He understood that that ain't the right thing to do just because. You know, there, um, there's a, a young man in, in our church. And um, I remember a few years ago, uh, how long has it been? Maybe about two years ago that he, he came back to the church. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I remember that he, he kind of told you that he didn't want to just jump right back in. And he was very honest with you, and he told you that. He told you that he just wanted to take his time. Yeah. Um, and we, he, we received that, you know. he said, I backslid. I was, I was smoking. I was drinking. I was looking at stuff I wasn't supposed to. and Because he was raised in a Christian home. Yeah. And, and, and but, he, but he was honest with you, and he mm -hmm. told you that, you know. And... And we began to see that. We began to see that, you know, he was just very observant. Mm -hmm. um, he would just, you know, receive and receive and receive. And he wasn't that loud. He just, you could just see that he was just taking it in. Um, the moments that he can be there for studies and for the sermons, you know, he was just, just be there for classes, for things and, and just receiving. But he was quiet. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. You can tell that he was just listen, listening attentively. Um, and, and I just, you could see the growth. Yeah. 
you could just see the growth and and I was like but he would leave you know he would just you know kind of just leave quietly and when you would ask him to kind of get involved in certain ministries and everything he would he wouldn't you know he would not get involved in anything really I actually had a conversation like 11 months in I sat him down I said brother I see leadership in you would you like to take some college courses and move toward uh, um, licensing for ministry? And he goes, I'm not ready yet. I need to fix me before I can help fix anybody else. Mm. And yeah. you know, and, and I love that because you just now when I see him speak. Or hear him speak. Or hear him speak. Like my spirit is just listening attentively and the impact of mm -hmm. his words are just so encouraging and i i'm just like wow lord what you're doing in this man's life mm -hmm. it is just amazing and i see the attentiveness and in, in what god is doing in his life in his family's life yeah. and I'm just I'm blown away and I just think to myself if others would just see that example and follow that example mm -hmm. you know because I see that leadership and I just you know I just pray that he just continue because I, I know that God is going to use him in such a tremendous yeah. way and and that is a good example of what we're reading right now. Yeah, yeah, I was it is. I was telling you that right before we started and when we were talking right now and I said, you know what, when you shared that with me, I said to you, that's exactly who I thought about um, because I'm I'm just I'm just really blessed, you yeah, know, with this. Yeah. And, um like here's another part that maybe some of you don't like this. If you were about to have surgery, Let's say a brain surgery or heart surgery, something really serious. And you had two surgeons. They both want to do the operation on you. One of them graduated at the top of his class. The other one barely made it through because he would skip a lot of classes. Who would you choose? Hmm. You would choose the one that's the most... The one that studied, the one that got the best grades, the one that never missed a day. And if he did miss a day, he went back so he didn't miss anything because he understood that people's lives were in his hands, basically. Absolutely. Their brains or their chest is wide open and life and death is in the choices and decisions that he would make or she make as a surgeon. Absolutely. How much more important is somebody that preaches the gospel? Even though what that surgeon is doing is important, it's only to save a person during this lifetime. But when you're standing behind the pulpit, that's for eternity. Yes. So let me ask you again. Are you seeking for leadership? And you haven't even read this one time all the way through. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> are you going to listen to somebody? And here's the thing, right? You, you can't hit me with, well, just because somebody's there every day don't mean they're a good surgeon. You're right. But the chances yeah. of them being a good surgeon, you're going to have higher chances of finding a good surgeon that has been there every day than one that hasn't. Same thing with a leader, a pastor, a Bible study. You're so quick to want to lead a Bible study group, but you haven't even read the book yet. Yeah, but there's also a difference between reading that every day than living it every day. Yes. But you got to know it. Yeah. You got to read it. You know, what did Paul do? Paul took the time to say, I'm going to spend time with the Lord. Yeah. And I'm not going to preach a word until I know I'm ready. Yeah. Until he says I'm ready. You know, so it's like, in the context of what I'm saying, you know, if you haven't read it, yes, of course, we read it and we learn from it. And, and But don't be so quick to ask for something. Because a great brain surgeon, let's go back to the surgeon. Imagine if he started performing surgeries three years before he learned it all. 
people could die on the surgery table. Well, yeah, look at what it took for me to choose the brain surgeon yeah. that I allowed to touch my head. <laughs> so let's say, let's say that surgeon says, well, you know, I lost a few, but then he learns, then he gets his degree, then he becomes a great brain surgeon, and life is good after that. But what happened to the ones that died? They don't come back. So here's what happens. I meet a lot of people that are leaders, that they become amazing leaders. But how many people died on the vine? Yeah. You know, and, and this is stuff we don't play with, man. This is stuff that is very serious. These are people's souls and eternity in your hands, and that is not something to joke with. And Paul understood that. Yeah. Paul understood. And he's like, you know what? I got to separate myself completely. So you know, I can be you know, ready. I look at I look at Paul as as that like also like that surgeon. You remember when my my brain surgeon, the first time when he when he did my brain surgery, he was so confident, and he knew that he was ready to do mm -hmm. my brain surgery, and he took on he took on the brain surgery and he did it. And man, it was, he was amazing. But when I went back, and we we talked about the second brain surgery he was not as confident yeah you know we went back and we talked about this was uh not even just about a year ago guys we went back and we were talking about doing um a second brain surgery and that's that's still on the table where he wanted to go in and they want to put the brain shunt in and he they talked about my ventricles being too small and everything but this time he went back and he says, I'm not confident um, to do it. And that he was gonna have to seek um, and send me to San Francisco to another specialist, another brain surgeon. It, it just reminds me of Paul stepping back, yeah. you know? Um, because he, you know, he felt that he, he wasn't ready. So I made the decision because I felt comfortable with him, you know, and he didn't, he wasn't confident that I, I stepped back and I said, then I, I don't want to have the surgery. Yeah. You know, yeah. I made the decision based because I realized he wasn't ready. So I, I decided that I'm, I'm not going to have the surgery at this time. You know, when I, when I signed up for the Bible college, um, I believe the first degree was 20, 20 courses or 120, 120 credits. And there were some exciting courses. Some were evangelism, casting demons out, counseling. And, um, you know, those are really exciting sounding. Like, that's like, glad I'm going to jump right into ministry. But then I was like really looking at the majors. Like, what do I want to major in? And the most boring one, honestly, at, at first, at, at eyesight, was biblical studies. And I realized... I don't know if it took a few days or whatnot. I was trying to make a choice because it says check where you want to when I was doing the application. Mm -hmm. And I said, wait a second. How could I do any of that other stuff? How could I do evangelism? How could I cast demons out? How could I do counseling if I don't know the book? Mm. So that's what I did. I, I took a whole year or and some change. Um, 20, 20. 20, a little, I think 18 months it took me, a year and a half, to do my degree, the first one, in biblical studies. Because I said, I need to know this book. Yeah. And that doesn't mean I know the whole thing. Nobody knows all the Bible. There's no way. I constantly learn. I learn new stuff all the time. But I'm like, I need the solid foundation. Yeah. You know, and I think that was very... That was a smart thing that I, I don't even credit myself. I believe that was the Holy Spirit in me just saying, hey, boy, you got to learn this stuff. You know, there's yeah. there's actually some jobs that will not, like, there was a, a job in, in in Southern California with working with St. Anne's, and it was actually working with um, teen moms. Mm -hmm. And it was working in the fields where um, it was a pregnancy school for, for young mothers. And they would only hire... Yeah. They would only hire women that were actually teen mothers and they, that had went through those type of hardships. Oh, and that would so you went, relate. Yes. And, you know, I 
like maybe years before um, I even moved here, I'm going to say about six years before that I had went through the process of, of you know, getting hired there and everything. And I, the only reason I didn't accept it, it was because it was all the way in LA and the, the you know, the drive was going to end up being so far and I didn't have a reliable car at that time. But yeah, they, you know, there's jobs that hire you through your life experience. Yeah. Like you have to go through that experience because if you don't have that life experience, then they won't hire you. Like a drug counselor. Yes. Like exactly. sister, sister Lydia. Sister Lydia. She's yeah. our assistant pastor. Her and her husband. She's a drug and alcohol counselor, yeah. but she came out of heroin addiction in the streets of Oakland. Yeah. yeah. You know. So I mean, yeah, that all of that, life all of that life experience. Yeah. You know, and um, that's one thing though. When I came out, was I thought, okay, I, I know this Bible. And then I start a church, and then I get hit with real life situations of people. So that was a whole mm -hmm. other thing that it didn't prepare me for. But I did have a solid biblical foundation. With that has to be the foundation here. Yeah. Anything to do with ministry, it begins in the Word. Absolutely. You know, and uh, but you know, I just thank God. You know, I thank God for Paul. I thank God for his decision to separate himself. Um. I'll be honest, I probably wouldn't have separated myself, but God allowed me to get six years in prison, and I was forced to be separated, but I thank God for it now. I probably would have came out running, too, you know? Were you running like, and gunning. Were you, like, reading this when you met me or something? Why? Because what do you mean? it took you three years to propose to me. <laughs> like, seriously, That's guys, funny. he courted me for three years. Made me suffer for three years. Suffer, huh? Yeah. Mm. Three whole years. I was like, when is he going to ask me to marry him? When is he going to ask me to marry him? Uh, why did he move me all the way over here? Mm. Three whole years. So praise God. So, I think, is that everything about this subject? Yeah. Nothing else? I thought I had something else. Maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, guys. So, um, oh, no, I, did, I didn't remember now what I was going to say. What? Say it. <laughs> Is, um, and again, we all see things through our lenses, so maybe I'm wrong. Okay, but. Like, I was very, like, when the Lord told me I'm going to preach, I argued with God. I literally argued with God. I'm like, I don't want to preach. I just want to be a good Christian. That's it. But when I had an opportunity, uh, this opportunity arose to join this Bible college. I understood my calling. I accepted my calling. So now I had to prepare for that calling. King David was just a shepherd boy. He was anointed king. He didn't become king till 19 years later. So even though the calling was on him, he had to still build up and build himself up to that. You know, so when I did the Bible college, just the first degree was 20 courses, 20, 18 months. And then I kept going toward my bachelor's. And now, you know, for I've approached a few people, you know, about, you know, licensing and this and that. And it's like, yeah, just do just do this class. Just do this one, this one, and this one. And it doesn't get done. And I'm like, dude, you ain't hungry. You ain't hungry. And, and whether those people are watching or not, oh, I'm not going to apologize. You ain't hungry. You know what I mean? I'm just being real. Because when I approached Sister Lydia and Al, boom, they were knocking these courses out left and right. You know, I didn't have to tell them. I didn't have to do anything because when somebody wants something that bad, you don't have to have anybody um, uh, pushing you and pushing you and pushing you and bugging you and bugging you and bugging you. You're so hungry, you're going to do it. You're like, man, I know what my calling is and I need to do this. And you just do it. So that's what I wanted to say. Well, yeah, I believe that's true. And I know that there can be different circumstances and I know, you know, and people will be like, I know that there's books and there's this and there's that and everything. But I know everybody has different situations and circumstances. Yeah, everybody and everything does. That we, make, we make a way for everything. I think if there's, 
you know, if there's things for other things, then we should also have them available for the things of the Lord as well. You know, we, we find a way. We, we do. Um, but I, I know that the Lord is going to make a way regardless. Um, here's, here's one thing that I, I did decide that I, what I'd like to do. Mm -hmm. Here's, I, I said, okay, Lord. And the Lord spoke to me about this. And I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy a set of the books for the church. Yeah. And I'm going to rent them out mm -hmm. to those who are going to do it. And they're going to be rented out for a period of time. But they're going to be rented out. It needs to be done within a period of time, one book at a one book at a time. Get that course done, and whoever else is going to do it, get that course done. And you know what? And I want those books turned back in. Yeah. But those are going to be the church books. And if somebody's hungry to do it, then they're going to get it done. Yeah. And they're going to be the church books. They're going to be the church property. Um, but there's no excuse for them not to get it done. You know, they will be there. Yeah. And and I think that that'll be a way for it to, to get done if it, if and and if somebody doesn't have the ability to get the books then we'll have them. We'll have everything needed for it to be done. Yeah. Exactly. For those that you've spoken to, you know? Yeah. Guys, when you want something, you don't need anyone else to tell you. Yeah. When you want something. Like right now I want some wings. And nobody has to push me. Is there any wings left? <laughs> what? God, you're so weird. What? Oh my lord. Oh, <laughs> oh my god. Alright guys. It's time to eat some wings right now. I don't know if there's... Maybe there's like... Oh yeah, I put like three of them inside the fridge. Three or four. That's all I need. Okay, then you can have the three or four wings. I made wings with sumac. All right, guys. God bless you, and um, we'll see you. Wait, no. Sunday. Yeah, we'll see you Sunday. Um, pray for my aunt, for her to be comforted. Uh, we have the celebration of life, my tia Anna, um, you know, and um, just the immediate family is going to get together. Obviously, because of COVID, a lot of the family is going to be watching online. But um, but just pray for my family, and uh, God bless you. Bye, guys. Bye. We love you guys.